my husband and I and my ex-husband built this maritime museum. We broke ground in 2004 and we opened to the public with a certificate of occupancy on July 3rd, 2007. So we have entered into our 17th year of operation. And um, my personal obsession with maritime history and shipwrecks has to do with becoming a diver at the age of 16. And I'm 68 now, so 52 years ago, when I learned how to scuba dive, back then uh, the diving community was predominantly male. And I had, um, you know, went on different dives on different local dive boats. And most of my partners were men because the sport was predominantly male. And um, after exploring different shipwrecks, I, I would come up, return to the dive boat and talk to my dive partner and, and ask, you know, what do you know about that wreck? Because I just found it fascinating that you've got this huge ship sitting on the bottom of the ocean. And I wanted to know the backstory. Diving was not my thing. The history of how these shipwrecks ended up on the bottom of the ocean floor is what drove me to become an obsessive researcher of shipwrecks and maritime history. Unfortunately, many of the men with whom I explored these wrecks really had no interest in the history. They were diving to get lobsters, we call them bugs, um, to spear fish. I mean, their interest lied elsewhere. And I just wanted to know how the wreck got there, how many people died, what efforts were made to save the crew where the ship sailed from, where she was bound. I wanted to know the backstory. So it launched this obsessive need to research New Jersey shipwrecks. So I spent a lot of time in cemeteries. Cemeteries are a phenomenal resource for not just maritime history, history of, of you know, all kinds. And um, I went up and down uh, cemeteries all along the New Jersey coast because many of the sailors and the passengers, crew members, captains were buried in these cemeteries. In many cases, they weren't buried in the cemetery, but in one instance, I can recall the longitude and latitude lines of the last known position of this sea captain ship was etched on his tombstone. And uh, I, I just found it fascinating to learn about these people, the passengers, the crew who sailed along the Jersey coast. And of course, New Jersey has more shipwrecks along its 127 miles of coastline than any other state in the country, including the Carolinas. I know the Carolinas uh, claims to be the graveyard of the Atlantic. Nope, 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 New Jersey's got it all over them. And um, just our documented shipwrecks alone exceed 4,800. There's several thousand more that were never documented, never recorded because so few people lived along the Jersey coast. So I've spent the last 52 years researching shipwrecks and maritime history and sailors. And um, it resulted in the construction of this museum. This museum was built on private lands. Um, we owned the property. It, this was our parking lot for our boat business. I had a diving business and a passenger boat business, which included a dive boat, a casino excursion boat to Atlantic City, a fishing boat, a one hour cruise boat. So it was quite a fleet of passenger vessels. And in 2000, Five, all of that was sold, which is why my husband and ex-husband are a party to this museum. Fortunately, they're extremely um, supportive of <laughs> my need to take valuable real estate on Long Beach Island and build a museum. So um, my husband and I, husband number two, and I live at one end of the building on the third floor. Husband number one is on the other end. 
it works for us uh, because we used our collective monies to build the museum and I'm really lucky to have two husbands that are very supportive both financially and, and otherwise in my need to preserve this important facet of our state's history. But um, we are in our 17th year and one of the most important elements of this museum is the fact that the diving community, the men and women who dive and explore these shipwrecks, make so many of their artifacts available for public view. They donate these artifacts and without the expense of, of their pursuit of, of the sport of diving, without their efforts, uh, the non-diving public would never see what's out there. So it's a, it's a very unique place and I absolutely love what I do and I'm, and I'm lucky to have the support not only of number one and number two husbands, but of the diving community. That's what keeps this place going. As I said, there are over 4,800 uh, documented shipwrecks off the Jersey Coast. My favorite is the Morrow Castle shipwreck, which in 1934, the Morrow Castle was a 520 foot long uh, luxury steamship owned by the Ward Line, which is a U.S. company. This vessel was built at a cost of five and a half million dollars, most of which was subsidized by the U.S. government. The vessel sailed from New York City to Havana, Cuba. She was engaged in one week cruises at a cost of $65 per person. $65 doesn't sound like a lot of money right now, but during the depression, $65 was a whole lot of money. And it took some passengers months to save up enough money to book a cruise on the Morrow Castle. Most of the passengers on the Morrow Castle were actually young men and women, single young men and women. It was a party cruise. They had alcohol, they had dancing, they had entertainment. Once they arrived in um, Havana, Cuba, there was more dancing and partying and gambling, everything that a young person would want to become um, a part of, you know, a party too. They loved it. it. It was a tremendous trip. It took two and a half days each way to sail from New York City to Havana. And um, they spent two days in Havana. One of the um, um, purposes of the Morrow Castle vessel that most people are not aware of is that the, she didn't just carry mail and passengers from New York to Havana, Cuba. She also carried munitions. Um, at the time, FDR was our president, and FDR was a sympathizer of the dictator Batista. And um, as a sympathizer, he shipped millions of dollars in munitions to Batista, and they were offloaded by the crew of the Morro Castle upon arrival. And this was something that Obviously, our president at the time did not want the American people to know about because they were standing in bread lines trying to, you know, get enough food to feed their families. And it would have been an embarrassment for the U.S. government that you were sending millions of dollars to another country when, in fact, our people are fighting to put food on the table. But on September 5th of 1934, uh, the Morrow Castle left Havana, Cuba on its way back to its birth in New York City. Unfortunately, there was a nor'east gale force storm off the Jersey coast, not much different than what we've just experienced here. And the seas were quite heavy, eight to 10 foot seas. About um, 
when, when she left on September 5th, um, it was reported by the crew that Captain Wilmot was found dead in his cabin. Of course, the ship's surgeon, Dr. Van Zyl, determined in two different um, remarks to the crew that he had died of a heart attack. To another crew member, he said he died of indigestion. Back then in the 30s, uh, people who died suddenly were often said to have died of cardiac issues or indigestion, when in fact, in the absence of an autopsy, there would be no way of ascertaining that. But suffice to say, when it was reported that Captain Wilmot had died, the second in command took over the operation of the ship. His name was Acting Captain Worms. Acting Captain Worms had the credentials and the license to operate a ship that size, but he did not have the experience that Captain Wilmot had. Uh, quarter of three in the morning, it was reported to Acting Captain Worms that there was a fire in the writing room. Captain Worms, in my estimate, based on the FBI files and the interviews with other crew members, it is my personal belief that Captain Worms was in a state of panic. For some reason, Captain Worms thought that he could get that vessel back to New York City. So he continued to maintain speed at about 18 knots, which is about 20 miles an hour, into a northeast wind. Now you have to picture a northeast wind going into the vessel. The vessel's going one direction, the nor'easter's going the other. Unfortunately, it served to fan the fire so much faster than if he had reduced speed and changed his course direction to get closer to shore. Sea, the world's greatest horror of horrors. The luxurious ward liner Morrow Castles being raked by flames, which broke out mysteriously shortly after midnight during a heavy storm eight miles off the Jersey coast. Many of the 300 passengers were trapped in their cabins. Some of the lifeboats were lowered, but others were burned in their davits. The gray dawn found the Jersey coast from Asbury Park to Point Pleasant dotted with hapless victims of a terrible disaster. Many are near death. Heroic first aid treatment on the beach has saved scores of lives this morning, but for many, it is too late. The sands where thousands played and frolicked this summer has become a vast morgue. More than 150 bodies have been gathered in. In all, 197 persons are dead or missing. Meanwhile, the monarch of Bermuda is steaming into New York with 75 survivors of the catastrophe, picked up from the sea when the Bermuda ship steamed to the aid of the stricken liner. Many of them are at the point of death. Several died after being rescued. Anxious and frantic relatives hunt the pier as the rescue ship gives up its pitiful toll. The plight of some of the survivors is heartrending. Little Robert Leonai of Woodside, Long Island, lost his father and brother. The steamship, Andrea Lukenbach, also was rushed to the scene of the disaster by its captain, Henry Hill, and picked up a score or more of half-dead passengers or crew who had leaped from the blazing inferno into the deep. What an end to a joyous 17-day cruise of the Caribbean. Aroused from sleep only a few hours from home and in scanty night attire, hurled into a maelstrom of death. They are still too stunned to tell a coherent story of those hours of terror.
As you see, I have a watch here that stopped exactly at 25 minutes to five. That's the time I jumped in the water. And from then on, I hung around the water, trying my best not to get all excited for seven hours. The boy on my life belt that didn't have no life belt or life preserve on. So they took him on and left me there. And three hours later, one of the one of the boats picked me up. We were in, we were in the water five hours. All except there was another girl in our party who was in another room, and we couldn't find her, and I still don't know whether the, she has been rescued or not. I'm hoping very much that she was. When the fire was first detected in the writing room at quarter three in the morning, it was um, reported to Worms, but under Admiralty law at the time, there's such a, the radio operator aboard the Morrow Castle, unlike the rest of the crew, who's hired by the company, the ward line, radio operators at that time were placed aboard passenger ships by the US government. They were not hired or under the employment of the company who owned the ship, which owned the ship. So George Rogers was the radio operator. There was a 38 minute delay from the time the fire was detected. And the vessel was about 10 miles on board to get light when the fire was discovered. So the SOS is the responsibility of the radio operator, but it must first be ordered by the captain. So of course, Acting Captain Warms and radio operator George Rogers are both deceased now. But one says, Acting Captain Warms says he ordered the SOS to be sent by George Rogers. George Rogers says no, he did not. Hence the 38 minute delay. 38 minutes is a long time to delay an SOS on a vessel that size that's on fire and in the middle of a Norris gale force storm. George Rogers, it cannot be proved, but George Rogers, the radio operator, I am 99.9% .9 sure that he not only set this fire, but that he was probably responsible for the death of Captain Wilmot. Captain Wilmot, after the vessel left Havana, Cuba, in the presence of two witnesses, Captain Wilmot met with George Rogers because he was so upset with the reports he was getting from passengers and crew about the personality of this radio operator. He was very combative. Um, he got into disagreements, not just with the crew members, but he had issues with some of the passengers as well. And Captain Wilmot was a people pleaser, hence his order to paint from bow to stern, stern to bow. He wanted that ship to be absolutely perfect, even if it impacted public safety in the long run. But he was one of the last people to see Captain Wilmot alive. Apparently in the presence of these two witnesses, Captain Wilmot remarked to George Rogers that Although he did not hire George, the ward line did not hire George Rogers, the government placed him on board the boat. Because he was such a disruptive force among the crew, Captain Wilmot told him that when the ship got back to New York, he would never again work for the ward line. He would make sure of it. And he probably had the ability to do that because he was a company man, well-respected, very experienced, had over 20 years with the ward line. So his work would have meant a lot to management. So when Captain Wilmot is found dead in his cabin, and then six hours later, at quarter three in the morning, now the ship's on fire. You get this 38 minute delay, and you can believe George Rogers, or you can believe acting Captain Warms, but a 38 minute delay resulted in an even greater loss of life than should have occurred during this tragedy. But George Rogers didn't stop there. George Rogers actually was responsible for saving one of the wealthy passengers 
bird, cage and all, before he jumped into the lifeboat. And uh, he was originally hailed the hero. He took his act to, um, to vaudeville, made some money doing that. And um, George ended up getting a job with the Bayonne Police Department. The Bayonne Police Department wanted to create communications between its uh, headquarters and its police cars. That was unheard of in the 30s. You know, to pick up a radio and speak to somebody back at headquarters. So who did they hire? George. George, the radio operator and the hero of the Morrow Castle. They hired George. Um, George has a boss named Lieutenant Vincent Doyle. Now, if I knew you were aboard the Morrow Castle, I'd be picking your brain for every little detail that you could explain to me. And I'd be saying, where were you? What did you do? I, I would... I want to know everything that you remember. Well, sure enough, Lieutenant Vincent Doyle starts asking George about, you know, his actions. What did you do? Where were you and all that? Well, George starts telling Vincent Doyle things about the fire relative to uh, points of origin and accelerants used. Well, if you don't set a fire, how could you possibly know this information? So it occurred to George that, you know, I think he knows that I did this. So he decided he needed to kill him. So George takes an aquarium heater, used to heat, you know, water in a, in a fish tank, and he decides to modify it to make it into a bomb, which he delivers to uh, Vincent Doyle's desk. Vincent Doyle lifts the box that contains this bomb, which detonates the bomb. The bomb wasn't strong enough. It mangled this poor man, um, fractured his leg, removed part of his hand, his fingers, and spent a long time in the hospital. George went to prison for attempted murder. Well, just like they do today, they let George out on good behavior. And they let him serve during World War II. Well, what does George do when he starts serving his tour of duty aboard the ship that he's assigned to? He starts set fires. He starts having confrontations with other crew members, some physical. George Rogers gets a dishonorable discharge. And by the way, that when the US government placed George aboard the Morrow Castle, had they done a background check on George, which I suspect they may have, they may have known that George had a background as a pedophile, an arsonist, uh, terroristic threats. He had a criminal record a mile long. So when he gets an honorable discharge from the military, George goes back to Bayonne. He figures, going to set myself up back in the radio business, which he's very brilliant at. And then he was a brilliant radio operator and repairman. He sets up a business in Bayonne. He borrows $1,200 from a man named George Hummel. Well, Mr. Hummel wants his money back. And he keeps hounding George, you know, I need my, my money back. So one day George contacts Mr. Hummel and says, I'm on my way with your money. Well, he was on his way all right. He went to Mr. Hummel's house with a hammer and he bludgeoned Mr. Hummel and his daughter to death. So George returned to Trenton State Prison where he died. Now, what I was saying about all the twists and turns of this, it is my personal belief, and, and it seems to be supported by many of the records that I've accumulated in the last 52 years, um, that the records of George Rogers, if you were to file a Freedom of Information demand for documents, there are none. All of his records from Trenton State Prison have disappeared from the face of the earth. The only other inmate whose records have disappeared from Trenton State Prison um, 
pertain to Bruno Hoffman from the Lindbergh baby kidnapping, both with very strong government ties. So I don't, don't believe that that's a coincidence. I also question the fact that we have thousands of pages of FBI files, and among the FBI files, some of the pages are redacted two-thirds of the information. It is understandable when the U.S. government redacts documents relative to agents' names and the identities of certain people, uh, but when two-thirds and more of many of these pages are redacted, it tells me that there's information that our government does not yet want the public to have access to. And um, right now that I am pursuing an appeal of the redaction of many of the documents that I most recently acquired from the FBI. The SLS was eventually picked up across the bay here by the Tuckman and Wireless. When the U.S. Coast Guard was notified that there was a large passenger vessel on fire up the Jersey coast, it was determined that the seas were so rough and the storm so intense that it would not be safe to launch a rescue craft at that time. Big mistake. Uh, the owners of fishing vessels in Brielle, Manasquan, Point Pleasant, all the, um, the um, marinas and, and boat operators in that area decided on their own to ask their crew members to volunteer their time because they knew that there would be people in need of rescue. And one of the most well-known heroes of the Morrow Castle is the Bogan family. The Bogan sent their 60-foot fishing boat, the Paramount, out to rescue passengers, and they were instrumental in saving 67 lives. And that was huge. But what these men did in, in conditions at sea that easily could have resulted in the loss of their vessels and their lives, the fact that they went out and did what they did it just speaks volumes of, of the compassion shown to these, these people. And yet they, they really didn't get the credit that was due to them because I believe that the government, and especially the Coast Guard, was embarrassed. You know, the, the Coast Guard is in operation for exactly this type of disaster and yet when they, when they deemed it too unsafe to launch a rescue craft, and these men took their 60-foot fishing boats out, uh, it was just an incredible feat that they, they accomplished. And um, they just didn't get the credit due to them. But the position that he was put in when he had to, James Bogan, when he had to explain in front of reporters and family members of those who had lost their lives and or their whereabouts and their status was unknown, when he had to explain to the public in a recorded um, interview how he instructed his crew to push the bodies true of the dead so that only the living were brought on board. It was such a bad position that they put him in and he didn't want to have to explain that in front of the families of these people. And he had five more jackets than he did. 67 people he saved, 72 jackets. He had five more jackets than he did people. And that was because he was trying to save room for the living which was the right thing to do. But how do you tell that if it were your family member, you know, if it was your mom and dad and your mom was brought in and your dad was pushed through the jacket, you would be mortified, which you should be, but 
logistically it was the right thing to do. And he just, the fact that he was forced to explain that publicly, I, I felt was, was bad. And uh, he didn't have to be subjected to that. Uh, other vessels, the Monarch of Bermuda, which was a, a large passenger vessel on its way back to New York City, they too played an important role in saving lives. Uh, people up and down the Jersey coast opened up their homes, their medicine cabinets, their closets for blankets and all that to aid in caring not only for those who, who died and whose bodies washed ashore, but also the injured. So there was a monumental public uh, outpouring of support for these poor people aboard the Marlow Castle. Get it. One of the, the major problems when the fire was detected, and remember this was during the depression, many of the crew members were inexperienced. One man that uh, my co-author Gretchen Coyle and I had interviewed, Jerry Edgerton. Jerry Edgerton was a farmer out west who hitchhiked across the country to get a job. And when he found out he could work aboard the Mara Castle, this man had never been on a boat in his life. He was 17 years old. He was a farmer. And he described the fire as it reminded him of a prairie fire. And the, the entire deck was painted with an oil-based paint. And it acted as an accelerant for the fire. We had an interview with Jerry Edgerton and Marjorie Giannini, a well-to-do passenger aboard the ship. The last two known survivors of the Marble Castle, we interviewed with Channel 6 News. And Mrs. Giannini, decades after the disaster, backhands Jerry Edgerton and says, I want you to explain to me where you were when this fire was set. She said, my husband and I were banging on doors to tell people the ship was on fire. What were you doing? Very indignant. And he stands up and he says, Mrs. Giannini, Giannini, I'll tell you where I was. He said, I walked over to the rail of the ship and I had to stand on one foot because the fire, the deck fire, was burning the sole of my shoe. So I stood on one foot. Well, when the soul was burnt, I changed feet. When that soul was burnt and my soul was burning, I jumped. And she was satisfied with his explanation. It, it apparently had been in her mind for decades. And unfortunately, many of the crew members failed to render assistance to the passengers. Much of their indifference to the safety of the passengers had to do with their lack of experience, their lack of proper training, and just plain panic. While the ship was still underway and heading back to New York City under the command of acting Captain Worms, some of the crew members dropped one of the lifeboats. There were, there were 12 lifeboats aboard the Morrow Castle, six on port, six on starboard. So some of the crew dropped one of the lifeboats while the Morrow Castle was still under its own power. Well, there was nobody on the lifeboat. As soon as the lifeboat hit the water, it was gone. Not a soul on board. So then they started lowering other lifeboats. When Captain Wilmot was alive, he was a company employee of the Ward Line. He had over 20 years working for the Ward Line, extremely experienced captain, but he was also a people pleaser. Captain Wilmot would order his crew between voyages to paint from the bow to the stern. When they reach the stern, they paint from the stern to the bow. There were so many layers of paint on the davits and the chains of the lifeboats that six lifeboats could not be dropped. They were stuck in their davits. And since they never held any drills and never had any uh, muster zones or, or safety instructions to the passengers, those six boats were still attached to the Morrow Castle 
when she ultimately lost power and stranded in front of Convention Hall. Of the five lifeboats that were launched with people on board, there were only five passengers. And they probably fought their way into the lifeboats. For the most part, the crewmen aboard the Morrow Castle, in sheer panic, abandoned the passengers and took off in lifeboats meant to carry up to 70 people. Some of those lifeboats only had 12 or 13 crewmen aboard. So it was such a terrible tragedy. Anything that could have gone wrong on the Morrow Castle did. A well-to-do passenger on a previous journey had tripped over one of the fittings for the fire hose and Captain Wilmot ordered that fixture to be dismantled and the deck made flush so that no other passengers would trip over it. So that resulted in a severe uh, incapacity of the fire suppression system. Anything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. So for many of the passengers, it was either jump or burn to death. And the, uh, the failure of the crew to hold safety drills or even uh, advise the passengers on where their life jackets were resulted in uh, casualties that very well could have been prevented. One of the biggest problems on the Mara Castle were the life jackets. The life jackets, the, the passengers had never been given proper instruction on how to don these life jackets. When some of the passengers found their life jackets and jumped into the water, if they did not hold the life jacket against their chest, one of two things happened. Either the life jacket came off of them altogether, or worse yet, the life jacket came up under their neck, rendered them unconscious, and they drowned face down in the water. So the design of the life jackets at the time played a huge role in the number of fatalities aboard the Morrow Castle. The, the number of fatalities to the best of our ability to, to figure from the original ship's manifest, 137 people on the passenger list died on the Morrow Castle. But they were not the only fatalities aboard the Morrow Castle. What many people don't realize is that Cuba at the time in the 30s was under such political turmoil, bloodshed in the streets of Havana, that families would pay the crew members aboard the Morrow Castle a couple dollars to smuggle their children onto the vessel and occupy unsold cabins. They had made arrangements for the children to be raised in boarding homes in New York City upon the return of the Morrow Castle. Now, unfortunately, when the ship was set on fire, these children became the first casualty. And because they weren't on the passenger list, uh, to this day, it'll be 90 years next year, um, little effort has been done on the part of our government to bring to the public's attention the disposition of these children, where they were buried, where their bodies were found. And um, it is our estimate that somewhere between 25 and 30 children died aboard the Morrow Castle who were meant to be transported to New York City to be raised in boarding homes. And when Gretchen Coyle and I began our research and we've been to Cuba seven times specifically for the purpose of meeting families whose loved ones died aboard this ship and um, it it has been a, a bittersweet research project 
because for many of these people until now, they had no idea what became of these children. And for many, it gave them, I don't believe in closure, but it gave them answers to questions that had been on their minds for decades. One of the, the children who, to his credit, um, Tom Taurus and a purser aboard the Morrow Castle, he was one of the crewmen who really did all that he could within his power to provide assistance to these, these poor Cuban children. And one little boy who had suffered third degree burns, uh, Tom Tarson, put the little boy over his back before he jumped into the water. And he knew enough Spanish to communicate with this little boy while they're in horrendous, you know, eight to 10 foot seas. And then he suddenly realized that the child was not responding and had to let him go. And um, the child obviously suffered an excruciating death. We met with his family and um, we wanted them to know the important thing was that an American sailor aboard that ship did everything in his power to save this little boy. Unfortunately, he was just burned so bad. They did not need to know how bad the child suffered and, and we didn't tell them, but um, it gave them some comfort knowing that, that somebody, an American sailor aboard that vessel actually did everything he could to save that little boy. Tom Torrison's daughter, it's such a difficult thing for her because she knew that her dad, based on all the records and the testimony of other crewmen, her father, was one of the few crew members who really went out of his way to try to save lives, especially the lives of these young children who had been placed on board. And when she hears people talk about the Morrow Castle and they describe it as the entire crew just abandoned the passengers, not true. Many of them did, but there were heroes aboard the Morrow Castle, like her father, like the cruise ship director, Mr. Smith, whose family donated his cruise hat and other things. So there were some heroes among the crew. Unfortunately, they were few and far between. The Morrow Castle is, in my estimate, one of the saddest, most uh, preventable maritime tragedies off the Jersey coast. And yet so few people have ever heard of it. Like people come into the museum all the time and they'll say, what do you have on the Titanic? And I just, it just boils my blood. I mean, the Titanic obviously was a horrendous disaster, struck an iceberg and a lot of people died. I get that, but with the Morrow Castle, there's so many twists and turns associated with this disaster. So much happened that could have been prevented. And um, you have the death of the captain, which very well may have been a murder. You have the intentional um, failure of many of the crew members to provide assistance to the passengers. You have the carrying of munitions to Cuba at great expense to the American taxpayers, but unknown to them. That these men were all convicted of, of several felony counts. And right outside the courthouse, they're laughing. Well, they're laughing because they, they, these were the men who were offloading the munitions in Havana, Cuba. They're laughing because they knew that the government was gonna overturn their convictions. They were never gonna see the inside of the prison. That's why, you know, that's why they're standing there with big smiles on their face. It's just such a, a horrific story and, and it just needs to be told. I just, I really hope it is someday, but you know, it probably won't be before I leave this earth, but I hope so. Dr. Breitstein had, had lost his wife um, to a cancer battle and his little boy Mervyn, whose picture is in the corner there, he decided to take his son on a cruise to try to 
get him out of the home and, you know, give him some comfort, you know, having lost his mom. During the fire, there was such utter chaos and confusion and smoke and uh, somehow he became separated from Mervyn and Mervyn's body was never found. Dr. Bregstein painted that of himself, that, that self-portrait, and um, it was donated by uh, the sister of Mervyn to the museum about three years ago, but he never forgave himself for having lost sight of his son and his body was never recovered. He did establish a scholarship in memory of his son and one of the scholarship medals is on um, display there. Alma Hill, she's my absolute favorite passenger. Alma Hill, whose uh, uh, documents and um, watch was brought by her daughter. One day this lady comes into the museum. She has a banker's box. And she said, my mother was a survivor at the Mar of Castle. Of course, that <laughs> certainly got my interest. And she brings in this box and it turns out that her mother was in her 20s. She was a young secretary for an insurance company in New York City. And like other young, single men and women, she saved up enough money to pay the $65 fee to uh, uh, book passage aboard the Morrow Castle to meet every young single people. And uh, apparently, based on her diary, she was having a wonderful time. All of a sudden, when the ship was on fire, fortunately, Alma was a great swimmer. She jumps overboard. Alma is swimming for seven hours in eight to 10 foot seas. Ultimately, she's picked up by the Bogan family and crew of the Paramount and brought on board and, you know, lives to, to tell about it. But she didn't tell about it. What Alma did, and we all know what post-traumatic stress is with men and women coming home from war, people who experience traumatic events for, for which they suffer for the rest of their lives, Alma Hill apparently suffered terribly from this. What she did after swimming all those hours before being picked up, when she was taken ashore by the Paramount and revived and, and um, was able to recover from the ordeal, Alma writes to the Elgin Watch Company and she said, hey, my watch doesn't work. Well, of course it doesn't work. It's full of salt water. So they write her back and I have their letter. They write her back and they say, oh, we're really sorry that you were involved in a shipwreck, but we can't fix your watch. It's full of salt water. Well, they never even offered to replace it. I mean, how terrible is that? They never, I mean, they should have given her a brand new watch. Elgin watches are very expensive. This was during the depression. So they asked her permission to use her story in advertising. <laughs> she must have been so indignant about that. Well then, remember, she's a secretary for a New York insurance company. She decides, well, I lost a lot of personal things aboard that ship when I jumped. So she writes, or she types up a two-page letter that she mails to the ward line and she says, look, I jumped off your burning ship. Here's an itemized list of what I left behind and I would like to be reimbursed. <laughs> right down to her underwear. She types up this list and sends them a bill for it, which we have. She didn't get a thing. I mean, she got nothing. But Alma, Alma, remember, was a single woman. When Alma ultimately married and had children, she refused to ever even talk about the Morrow Castle disaster. But what she did, and clearly she was suffering terribly, she communicated by telegram with other people she had met on the Morrow Castle, young people, and with those who had passed away during the disaster, she communicated with their families. So for years, Alma Hill kept up this correspondence 
with other people who were directly involved with the Morrow Castle disaster, and unbeknownst to her children and her husband, unknown meaning the cause or, or the reason for this, Elma Hill had a bracelet made for herself. It was an ID bracelet that said Alma Hill, Glenside, PA. Alma Hill wore that bracelet for the rest of her life. She never took it off, never explained why she wore it. But when she passed away and her daughter found her diary and all these telegrams and correspondence between her and other people associated with the Marm Castle, in her diary, she explained that during the seven hours she was swimming and she described the pushing away of burned bodies. And it was a horrific description of what this lady suffered. But the entire seven hours she was swimming and she used the Seeger light as her beacon to shore because this fire was in the middle of the night and it was pure blackness. So the only thing she had to go by was the Seeger light. So she kept swimming toward that light. But in the back of her mind, she, she explained in her diary, her biggest fear was that she didn't make it. And if she didn't make it because she was in her, whatever she went to bed with, her pajamas, she had no ID on her. So she thought, if they find my body, they're not gonna know who I am. So that is why she had that ID bracelet made and it never came off of her arm until the day she died and her daughter removed it. It's such a sad, sad story. And there, there are so many of these uh, stories that have been fortunately preserved by family members of, of these passengers and crew. Yeah, that's probably the, the only good that came out of the Marl Castle disaster was that it did cause our government to establish new policies and laws with regard to safety at sea and the requirement for uh, drills and, and education of passengers as to what to do under such circumstances. Yeah, this particular uh, publication, Morrow Castle and Mohawk Investigations, the only good to come out of the Morrow Castle disaster as well as the Mohawk was that it forced the government to address the issue of safety at sea and all the things that went wrong on the Morrow Castle resulted in rewriting the requirements for such things as um, the type of paint that was used uh, on the decks and other parts of the vessel. Um, if you look at the interior of the Morrow Castle, she had such heavily varnished wooden furniture. Um, the, the need for uh, safety drills of the crew, um, the fire suppression system, uh, so many changes in safety at sea came about because of this disaster. And had these been in effect when the Morrow Castle um, was set on fire there in 1934, possibly many lives would have been saved by it. Like I said, there's pages and pages of um, things that were addressed during this investigation. Unfortunately, also, people who wanted to profit from the Morrow Castle for instance, the life insurance company whose ad I have up there, they use the Morrow Castle disaster to promote the sale of life insurance. And, and uh, the company that created asbestos, this was before they knew that asbestos was a carcinogen. They used the Morrow Castle disaster to uh, promote the use of asbestos in new ship construction. So I don't know if that was a, a good thing to come out of it now that we know what asbestos is made of. But it uh, made, made a big difference. Ship. She sat there in front of Asbury Park for six months. 
At one point, the governing body of Asbury Park got the bright idea. Remember, this was during the Depression. All those businesses on the boardwalk in Asbury Park, since this disaster happened after Labor Day, all those businesses were closed. Many of them were not going to reopen because there was no business and they were going down the tubes. Well, when the Morrow Castle ended up in front of Convention Hall, all those businesses quickly reversed their closed signs to open. And they profited from, they took pennies and other coins and, and pressed them and inscribed the Morrow Castle, September 8th, 1934. They actually made money and um, reopened and uh, drew hundreds of thousands of people from all over would come to, to see this ship. She smoldered for eight days, so she was quite a, uh, a public attraction and drew lots of people to Asbury Park. The, when the governing body got the idea that because it brought so many people to Asbury Park and was a big boom to businesses, they got the idea that they were going to make a deal with the ward line to keep the, the ship there as a tourist attraction. The local residents were so upset about the idea because all of these lives were lost due to this tragedy and they felt that it was in very poor taste for the governing body to want to profit from um, such a horrific tragedy resulting in such a great loss of life. But what really clinched the deal <laughs> is that the Morrow Castle had in its hull a huge cargo of untreated animal hides that it was bringing back from Cuba. And every time the wind would come off the ocean, the stench of these decomposing animal hides <laughs> would drive everybody off the beach and off the boardwalk. So they decided, you know, I don't think we want this ship here anymore. The, our government, I don't know what they were thinking, but clearly people who had the salvage crews and government officials who boarded the uh, burned out Morrow Castle ship saw that there was, the vessel was so badly twisted up and destroyed, but they decided to tow the Morrow Castle to New York City to see if she could be converted for troop use and once they got her to New York City, they decided she was so badly, badly damaged and just a twisted, burnout piece of junk. They then took her under tow to Baltimore, where she was cut up for scrap metal. They only got $34,000 in scrap metal from the Morrow Castle when she was um, taken to Baltimore. But why they, they didn't know from looking at her in Asbury Park that there was nothing that could be converted from this vessel. I, I don't know why they went through such an expensive feat of taking her first to New York only to take her back to Baltimore. But anyway, so it's $34,000 in scrap metal. You can see on the photos that we have the port anchor when the Marmot Castle drifted ashore in Asbury Park the port anchor was still attached to the Mara Castle. Recently, a uh, well-known, highly respected diver named Bill Cleary was able last November to recover the anchor, the starboard anchor of the Mara Castle. And I'm pleased to say that, that Bill did a lot of research here and reviewing FBI files and photos and others other information available to him and um, he was able to recover that starboard anchor in November of last year and plans to put it through um, an electrolytic bath and to preserve it and restore it to uh, its condition before spending almost 90 years in salt water and uh, of course it's our hope that we have this magnificent anchor out front of the museum, but uh, that remains to be seen. It turns out that a, a commercial fisherman had lost considerable amount of gear on this anchor, and 
asked Bill to um, dive this site, not knowing what it was, um, to perhaps retrieve some of the gear that they had lost. And he and other divers did in fact dive the site only to find out it's not a ship, it's an anchor and it's 10,000 pounds. Now, he must've been shitting himself when he found that, when he realized it. <laughs> the funny thing is he, he spent a couple hundred hours here. You know, like I said, I live upstairs. I come down at 10 o'clock at night and there's Bill. I'm like, oh shit. I never asked him what he was working on. Okay. Well, the funny thing is Bill was trying to keep this very, very quiet and spending hundreds of hours here doing all this research and going over the photos and stuff. It's, it's funny in retrospect now to, and I never asked him what he was doing, you know, because it really wasn't any of my business. But he, uh, I mean, it's such a, a big, big deal to have gotten it. And of course, divers, they're ball busters, you know, they're like, ah, you don't know, it's the market. Mm -hmm. it, it is. But um, kudos to, to Bill for being able to retrieve this incredibly important part of, of maritime history and specifically for me, my favorite shipwreck, the Morrow Castle. Good job.